Welcome to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We're talking about farming, but instead of imagining the smell of rich, earthy soil, we want you to imagine the smell of salty sea air. The farmers we're talking to today are based in Mystic and Stonington, and their farms are located at the mouth of the Mystic River in one case, and a 40-minute boat ride off the coast of Stonington in Fishers Island Sound in the other. In a moment, we'll talk to oyster farmer Will Cedia and Oyster Club's Dan Miser. Later in the hour, you'll hear from kelp farmer Susie Flores. But first, the most delicious bivalves you can possibly eat, scallops and oysters. Mm, the scallops part may be debatable. How could you not like scallops? Because I don't know how to make them. It's one of the easiest things you could possibly cook in the world, and they're delicious and succulent. I love, I have like a weird love affair with scallops in my life. Do tell, because I have nothing but time. By the way, I'm twirling my hair. Tell me about your love affair. <laughs> she really is twirling her hair. Listen, <laughs> scallops are unbelievable. They're succulent, they're delicious, and the easiest place to start with everything when it comes to a scallop is to understand the difference between a bay scallop and a sea scallop, right? Aha, aha, aha. Ooh, ooh, yes. Uh, is there anyone in, in, in the crowd? Uh, yes. Uh, Question. Ms. Castro. Yes. Yes, yes, please. What is the difference between a bay scallop and a non bay scallop? And can I make one less slimy than the other? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. That's where I was going to go. The easiest way to remember it is this. Bay scallops are smaller. Sea scallops are bigger, right? Think about this. A bay is smaller than the sea. So if it's a bay scallop, it's a small scallop. If it's a sea scallop, it's a big scallop. How about that? Look huh? at you. <gasps> Honestly, that completely See? resonated with me. Okay, go on. Now, sometimes when I go shopping for scallops... I see dry scallops, like neon sign, smoke signals. Is the scallop not wet? Listen, they come from the ocean. Obviously, they're going to be wet. But here's the thing with them. So they call them dry pack scallops because they supposedly dry them off. It doesn't really mean that they're dry. And it's, it's the single most important thing when cooking a scallop is that it's dry. Physically dry? like 100%. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you what happens. So if you don't if you don't dry it off before you cook it, what happens is when you put it in that pan, all that moisture comes out. And what happens, the scallop essentially steams. And when it steams, it can't <gasps> sear. So you can't have the Maillard reaction, which is, it's not caramelization. It's called the Maillard reaction, happen in a pan with a protein if there's water present. Did you get an 800 on your SAT verbal? <laughs> Listen, only in food. I can make jokes and talk to you. <laughs> anything else, I don't know anything about Okay, where do you get your scallops? Well, so when I buy scallops locally, my store that I go to here in Connecticut, they carry Stonington scallops, <gasps> which are the best local scallops on the planet. We have beautiful cold waters. Uh, the scallops love that. So what happens is they get harvested by hand. So here's the thing. When you talk about sea scallops, you have a couple different things to talk about here, right? You have diver scallops, mm -hmm. and then you have scallops that have a number beside them, okay? Oh. So if you see scallops that are like... Uh, you know, 14, 16, or 14, 18 sea scallops. That basically means there's 14 to 18 per pound, right? Oh. If they're uh, like a U4 or like a U7 scallop, that means that they are basically four or seven per pound. And usually they're considered to be harvested by hand where they don't quite do that so much anymore, but literally a diver goes down and grabs them and harvests them. No way. By hand. Pretty by cool, right? By hand. I would love to do that. We should go do that. I think I see a segment in the making. Okay, can I? Can we just do a quick step-by-step? -step? Yeah, I just don't know if the radio works underwater. Go ahead. It probably doesn't, but okay, we'll, yeah, we'll figure that we'll out figure later. Out. Okay, so I go to the monger. And yeah, you go to the monger. I go to the monger. I say a pound of scallops. Right. He's going to say bay or sea. Which kind are we making? Well, we're going to do sea scallops, Okay, right? sea so. scallops, Mr. Monger. Thank you. So he gives me right. a bag of, what do I have, 12 sea scallops? Let's call it 12. That's an easy number. I like that. Okay. I pack it on ice. I put it in my gas-guzzling SUV. I go home. I immediately call you. Yes. Plum, I have, I have a dozen sea scallops. Help. So first things I'm going to do is clap. Yay! I'm excited you bought scallops. <laughs> we're going to clap for that. The next thing I'm going to tell you to do is to grab your paper towels. Okay. And I want you to roll out about a 18, 20 inch section of paper towels on your countertop. And I want you to take each individual scallop, put them on the paper towel. Okay. Right? Place them on the paper towel and then cover it and roll it up. 
Roll or it just leave it covered. Yeah, I roll them up. What you're doing there is you're getting all that moisture off the scallops right now. Okay, so... And let it hang out. Let it hang out. Listen, don't cook scallops cold. Cook them at room temperature, right? Oh, thank you for telling me that. Yeah, because it takes it much longer to get to where you want it to be if it's cold. Okay. You know, any kind of meat, any kind of protein, steaks, pork chops, scallops, I'm going to do them at room temperature. Let them come. To, let them warm up a touch. Okay. They're not going to catch anything bad. Okay. That, well, I was going to ask that. Okay, so I have the scallops. I've put them on a paper towel. I've wrapped them up. Perfect. I'm waiting. Yep. While I'm waiting, you know what I'm doing. Uh, you're making a margarita? Hello. Uh of course. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> of course you Salt, are. please. Salt, please. Okay, glug, glug, glug. There goes a margarita. Now back to my scallops. What do I do next? So I'll unroll them and keep that salt out you put on that margarita because you're going to use a little bit of that, right? So oh, you're going to unroll them. What I want you to do now is take a little sprinkle of that salt and put it on the scallops while they're on that paper towel. And I'm doing okay. my hands in there. You see, I can't help so myself. So am I. So am I. I know. I like but it. But here's why. When you put a little bit of salt on a piece of seafood before you put it into that pan, it's going to firm it up a touch, right? Oh. So having it firm makes it much easier to work with in the pan. And this is all, listen, you don't have to do any of this stuff I'm talking about, but it makes it cook much, much easier. No, 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 no. Know? I'm following this step by step. Perfect. Okay, so okay. I've I've seasoned the scallops with right. my margarita salt yep. or my Maldon yep. salt or whatever else I salt. I love it. <laughs> the Maldon salt works great. Yep. Or just a little okay. kosher salt is also fantastic. Fantastic. Do I need a um, pan? Not yet. So okay. I want you to look at the scallops now, right? On the side of the scallop, yes. there is a little rectangular muscle called the connector muscle. That's what connects it to the shell. Okay. Wh who gave that it the authority to be sold with this muscle? <laughs> Listen, they thought they think they're giving you something extra, but it's it's garbage. You don't want to eat it. Ugh. When All you right. sear it, it gets super tough and rubbery. I take it pulls right off. Just take it off and throw it away. Okay. Give it to the dog. Just with my just with my little digits, I just pull it right yes, off. Yes, yes. Always remember the, the best tools you have in the kitchen are attached to your body, your hands. Is that right? That's the best. <laughs> yes. I, 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 <laughs> you, you have two hands. You were born with them. I've actually wow. seen them in person. You have. I have. <laughs> okay, um, so I pull off that little connector. Yes. Do and they, it may not be on every single one of them because sometimes they come off in the packing process or in the shipping process or in the, as they put them in the thing at the fishmonger's market, you know. Yeah. So they may not, but, but check them and take it off. All right? Okay. Next, you're going to take a saute pan. And this we're almost done. There's only a couple of steps. Wait, am I doing a cast iron pan? Am I you doing can. a nonstick pan? Listen, I would just, if you have a nonstick pan, it gives you a, a leg up. You can definitely use that. Uh, a cast iron pan, same thing because it's seasoned nicely. A okay. stainless steel pan works fantastic as well. There's really no right or wrong here. Okay, I'm going to do the cast iron because okay. I like it these days. Perfect. Okay. So the key thing to remember when doing this is you want it hot. You want like it to the be sun. hot. Yes, searing hot. I call it, you'll see wisps of smoke coming off the top of the yes! pan. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know that phenomenon. <laughs> you do. Yay! <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> so you're going to take your pan, put it on a high heat. I like to put a little bit of butter, just a little bit, okay. right? And let that butter kind of see it sitting in the pan and kind of melt, and then add a touch of olive oil to the pan, right? Oh. Don't go crazy with it. Double fat? Yeah, here's what happens. That butter's going to add a lot of flavor, and the olive oil is going to help it from burning so quickly. Arr. Right. There you go. I just purred um, at you. Okay. I know. I'm, I feel a little weird about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so the scallops are ready. Yes. The pan is ready. Wisps of smoke coming off the pan. Wisps of smoke. Here is the key thing. Oh Get yourself a good pair of tongs. I thought you said right. I just needed my fingers. You can use it with your hands too, but I don't want you to burn your okay, fingers. Okay, fine. Because I know that you do a lot of stuff. I don't want your hands to get burned. Okay, tongs. A little pair of tongs. So what I want you to do is take one scallop at a time, and you're going to start at 12 o'clock on the pan. Okay. And place them 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 9, 9, 10, 10 11. 11, 12. <gasps> right, because right? we bought 11. 12 scallops. Right. Okay. By the time you place that last scallop, it's now time to flip the first one. No! Witchcraft. Yeah. So what's going to happen is, <laughs> witchcraft. <laughs> what happens is you'll see it'll have a beautiful, nice sear on the bottom of the scallop. You want it to be brown and, and crispy and delicious and beautiful. So that's when you want to flip them. Okay. Right. And then you just flip them the same order. Shh, 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 shh. Right. And okay. so if you go a minute and a half on one side, a minute, minute and a half on one side, then you probably want to go, you know, 30 seconds less on the other side. Really? And it'll be cooked through. And you got it. That's so it? Here's the key thing at the end. Here's the key thing at the okay. end. Okay. You're going to take a plate with some paper towel on it, and you're going to take the scallops out of the pan onto the plate. Yep. Let them hang out on that plate with that paper towel for 10 or 15 seconds. What happens is they have a lot of moisture that comes out of them, right? Oh. Uh -huh. And this will keep it from being all over the plate. While it's on that paper towel plate, I like to put a little salt and pepper on them again, and then I serve them. 
beautiful, delicious scallops. They make me so excited. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you, if you do that, folks, you will cook perfect scallops every single time. This could be a game changer for me. Maybe I just needed that lesson. Thank you very much. I'm also excited to get to another shellfish lesson, but this time I'm graduating from scallops and moving on to that edible aphrodisiac, the oyster. If you want to talk to a couple of oyster nerds, you can't do better than the owner of Oyster Club, Dan Miser, and the oyster farmer, Will Cedia. Will and Dan are joining us by phone from Mystic. Will has a degree in aquaculture and fisheries from the University of Rhode Island, and he co-owns Six Penny Oyster Farm in Noank. Aquaculture isn't new, and certainly oyster farming has a long history in Connecticut, starting with indigenous peoples. But ocean farming, in general, is front of mind these days as the fishing industry changes and we strive for sustainability in our farms. The area we live in is so productive, or at least it was very productive, still is very productive. So um, we had a lot of uh, commercial fishing. So you could get your shellfish, your fish, all from just boats going out daily and dredging or whatever, you know? So farming was always there, but it's not nearly as, it's much more prevalent now because of the sustainability aspect behind it. Got it. That was Will. This is Dan. Yeah, I, I, I would say that the, the sustainable nature of, of aquaculture is really the driving force you know, in the last few years and certainly moving forward. I mean, to, to Will's point, you know, the, this region, New England, and, and most of coastal New England and, and the eastern seaboard of the United States, for the most part, is, is a naturally very productive area, right? I mean, in the estuaries and the bays, that's where all life starts for, for the ocean. But by utilizing aquaculture and by practicing those methods as opposed to just wild farming and dredging and things like that, you have a system that is one, way more sustainable, but also two, the impact in terms of the environment that it's in, aquaculture actually has a net positive impact habitat. on the environment that it's in. It's one of the uh, habitat forming. Yeah, it's basically. habitat forming. It's even the most responsible land farmers. And I say that as someone who has a farm, there's parts of what you're doing that may be disruptive to a local ecosystem. When, when you have aquaculture, it's the only type of agriculture that I'm aware of and maybe one of the only things that we as human beings do that actually has a net positive impact on the environment that it's in. So it's a, it's a, a beautiful part of restorative efforts. It's a beautiful part of farming in this country. And it's also this great thing for our economy. It's a whole new economic opportunity for, for farmers, in particular, young farmers, guys like Will, that went to school for it and specialize in it and, and are making uh, a living at it as well. Aquaculture, when I was studying it, the big thing they drilled in our head is you're going to have an uphill battle in most things you do. Aquaculture has this really bad connotation associated with it due to the fact that people think of fish farming. And fish farming, mm. like Dan was saying, you know, the best fish farmers can be very responsible in what they're doing, but things can go wrong. Escapees, you know, you're introducing antibiotics into the, the waters. You have fouling going down. So, you know, you're creating anoxic zones on the bottom, which are just decimating local areas. But the great thing about oysters are you buy oysters, you put them in your bags and they filter the water. You know, they're eating phytoplankton and that's how they grow and grow their calcium carbonate. They also filter most solids. You know, they have pseudo feces and feces. So they're taking through pretty much anything that can fit through their cilia. They're going to filter through. So it's kind of incredible to see what they could do. Please talk dirty to me and use the word <laughs> feces. And what was the other one? Photo feces? Cilia. Oh, C Lord. Have. Feces and feces. Uh, clearly, my next band name is uh, Celia feces. <laughs> Will, you brought up being responsible when you do this. I, I've read about how you grow oysters. Talk about that. Like, how's the process? And It really depends on where you want to grow. So, like, the first step of being a farmer is you pick your body of water you want to grow in. You know, uh, this looks like a great area. You're watching flow rates. You're taking salinities. You know, a good indication that you're going to be able to have a successful product is seeing wild of, of that same species already growing in that area. Where I farm, I farm in a cove. And at low tide, where most of my farming is being practiced, we get down to about a foot and a half. So I can't use, utilize the water column as much as I would 
per, maybe one day would like to. So I do a floating bag. So it's called bag culture. So we essentially have these uh, probably like two feet in length, uh, these mesh PVC coated bags that we put floats onto. All those mesh bags have different sizes um, and the sizes are based off the size of the oyster we're putting into the bag. And it's kind of a rudimentary process. You know, you start with your baby oysters and the smallest size mesh. You put them in the water, wait a few weeks, go out there. You'll see probably a big pop in growth. Then we have tumblers and machines that will sort them down to get the keep, you know, you want to keep the same cohort of oysters, same size with each other. Um, and it's just basically watching um, and making sure that they're growing. I run my farm very much like a hobby. My business partner, he works for another farmer full time. And I work with Dan uh, as his raw bar manager, you know, shucking oysters by night. So we both have other stuff and we kind of consider this just a really expensive hobby that we enjoy doing. I'll bet you had no idea that oysters were such good, efficient water filterers. Water filterers. Yeah, you know. That well, one. <laughs> listen, <Yeah. laughs> what you do probably know is that they're delicious, but where does their flavor come from? Funny you should ask. Dan Miser, who is a chef as well as the owner of Oyster Club in Mystic, explains the concept of miroir after the break. And later, kelp farmer Susie Flores introduces us to the sea veggie we're all going to be eating in the very near future if we aren't already. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Earlier in the show, we learned how oyster farmer Will Cedia grows the six-penny oysters you may have slurped at Dan Miser's restaurants in Mystic. Will and Dan are back, and they're going to tell us about the flavor of oysters, the nuances of oysters, and how to really enjoy them. Here's Dan. I'm going to break it down in layman's terms, the way oysters work and its connection to the wine world. In the wine world, we talk about terroir, right? You can take a Chardonnay that is grown in Burgundy in France. That's a grape, Marisol, just so you know. It's not just a particular type of wine. That's a grape variety. <laughs> it's a grape variety. <laughs> And you can take that same exact grape, that same plant, and plant it in Oregon, plant it in the East End of Long Island, plant it in Sonoma. And with the same genetics, because of its location and the farmer and the process, you can get four very, very different flavors, four very, very different interpretations of what that Chardonnay clone can be. The same is true with oysters. So on the East Coast of the United States, from a genetic standpoint, what is it called? The C. virginica is the Latin name. Yeah, Crassosteria virginica is East there you Coast. Go. West Coast is Crassosteria diabetes. Right. Gesundheit. Uh, my band name just changed. <laughs> Second band name. But point being, <laughs> you can take those oysters and you can take that seed and you could put one out at Will's farm at the mouth of the Mystic River. You could take that same exact seed and plant it in Ninigrit Pond over in Rhode Island. You could take that same exact seed, plant it over at Fishers Island, New York, take that same exact seed and plant it somewhere up in Maine. And you're going to get four very, very different oysters. And the reason for that, just like in the wine world, we say it's terroir. In the oyster world, we say meroir. So it, it's the environment, the oceanic environment that it's in. It has to do with tidal flows, salinity, sunlight, predation. It has to do with depth, the style in which the oyster is grown, whether you're doing floating bags like Will, whether you're doing lantern suspension like they do at Fisher's Island, or whether you're doing bottom culture like they do down at Mystic Oyster in Noeg. All roads point back to wine. Plum, it's like they're talking my, my language. Yeah. We're lucky because, honestly, you know, one of my favorite guys, Dan Miser here, is an icon in Connecticut. Such a cool guy to talk to about food. What do you think are some of the top three or five oyster varieties that you find people like the most? At Oyster Club, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that, really. Our mantra is really taking advantage of the amazing resources that we have in our backyard. There's wonderful oysters on the West Coast and no knock against them. There's great oysters that come out of the Chesapeake and, you know, Virginia and the Carolinas. And there's great oysters that come out of the Gulf. I personally believe that if you are looking 
for the perfect oyster on the half shell to be eaten raw that, you know, the Southern New England oysters, which we have in our backyard, that there's, there's no better place to be. At Oyster Club, we carry Will's six penny oysters. We carry the oysters out of Noank. So right there, you're getting two oysters. And this is what's kind of cool, getting back to the different farming types. Will's got his uh, floating culture. The guys in Noank have bottom culture. They're sharing very similar waters, but you get two very different oysters. So we like to show that to our guests because they're both delicious, very complex and dynamic in their own right. Uh, the Fisher's Island oysters. In the oyster world, they're legends. Very few farms have been doing it as long and as well and at the national level that Fisher's Island Oyster Farm has been. We carry their oysters, we're very proud to. And then we also like to showcase the Rhode Island pond oysters because we're the last town here in Connecticut before you hit Rhode Island and there's some really beautiful oysters that come out of the salt ponds of Rhode Island, the Ninigrit Nectars. They're uh, the Bean family, Matt Bean is the oyster farmer over there. That's his oyster, his Ninigrit Nectar. It's a little bit of a smaller oyster, deeper cup. Uh, it has that sweetness. It's not quite as salty. You don't get quite the same level of salinity that you do with some of like a Fisher's Island, which has a little more open water exposure to it. But it's beautiful because, you know, between the Fisher's Island, the Ninigrit Nectars, the Six Pennies, and the No Angs, if I line those four oysters up right in front of you, all of those oysters are as local as they can get. All of them were buying direct from farmers, so they couldn't be any fresher. And if I put those in front of you, there is a noticeable difference between every single one of those oysters, the complexity, size, salinity, sweetness, every single one of them are going to be talking to you in a different way. So, you know, for us, we're really fortunate. We, we have geography on our side here in Mystic. I'm curious, what are your favorite oysters since you guys are around oysters all the time? Uh, not to be biased, but uh, <laughs> I love mine, but uh, you know, I like to do a lot of different things with my oysters. So like if I'm eating them raw, I'm going to go mine 100% of the time. But if I'm going to broil oysters or I'm going to grill them, I might want to bottom cultured oysters. Those produce like a really hearty shell, usually a little larger in size. It's kind of more of what you're trying to do with the oyster is the type of oyster you should go after. Right. I'm just trying to throw it down my gullet. Six Honestly. pennies, six pennies, Fisher's Island, like, <laughs> something a little bit smaller, you know, you don't want to be chewing on a steak necessarily. It should be something right. that you can chew in about four to five bites. A common mistake where I see people when they eat oysters, they just shoot it down. I mean, it's food. You should chew it. It has a you lot should of- chew it and enjoy it. Right. It has a lot of depth to it. The flavors expand so much. And the cool thing about oysters are you have that liquor in there. It's already like a natural condiment on it. So you get your mouthful of water and that's where you can taste where it's coming from. But then the meat has this crazy depth to it. East Coast oysters are known for if you chew them around five to seven times, it's supposed to release this uh, kind of cantaloupe melon taste. And I taste that every time now. Then it has this fantastic sweetness to it. We can't have an oyster expert on the show and not ask Will for tips on shucking. There's siphon shucking, which so if you're holding the oyster with the flat side on top, you can go through the side. So that's siphon shucking. There's lip shucking, which is very popular down in like the Chesapeake area. And that's going from the top of the oyster where like the round part is on the top. And then there's hinge shucking. So I like to use these very thin pointy knives that can barely just, they go right into the hinge and you just wiggle it in there a little bit and you turn it like a key and the top shell should just barely pop off. And from when it pops off, you can kind of lift up that top shell a little bit and you'll see the abductor muscle, the one part where the oyster is connected to, and you can just easily cut that muscle and take it away from it and it looks like a perfect oyster. There's plenty of oysters I despise and I don't look forward to shucking. Um, and then there's other oysters I get really excited to shuck. This area where we live produces really great oysters, not only for taste, but for shuckers. I just learned that Will all these years has been ordering oysters based on how easy they are to shuck and not which ones. <laughs> well done. Well done. The, the, the cat's out of the bag. A seasonality. I mean, I know you can buy these oysters year round, but, you know, for someone at home, do they think of this as a seasonal item or can, is it something they should buy year round? With the amazing oyster farms that we have in the region, these guys are growing and selling beautiful oysters year round. That being said, you know, when you get into the colder water months, I personally enjoy oysters more in the winter months. The meat of the oyster gets fatter and plumper. 
they get sweeter, everything, all those sugars concentrate. Sometimes in the summer, uh, in particular, when the oysters are going through the spawning process, they can be a little flabby. You know, you've all seen oysters that are really uh, translucent. They don't look like they filled up the shell. Those are generally summertime oysters. There's nothing wrong with them. They're still delicious and they're still, you know, a beautiful farm product. But without question, depending upon the time of year, And having specifically to do with water temperature, the oyster will look and taste different. Seasonality is huge with oysters. So with Crassosteria virginica, the East Coast oyster, um, when water temperatures are under 50 degrees, they totally dormant. They stop filtering. They stop eating. Uh, So that's why oysters, people say oysters taste really good and full in the winter months is because right now temperatures in southeastern Connecticut, I think we're at like 70 degrees. So in the next couple of weeks, what the oyster is going to start doing is building its glycogen levels, which is all those sugars and its fat resources for winter. So that's why you get these really plump, beautiful, sweeter tasting, gorgeous oysters in the winter. In the fall months, they're building up for hibernation. They're building up their blubber. Yeah. Literally, that's exactly what they're doing. Um, but then, you know, come April, as soon as the water temperatures come back over 50 degrees, oysters are thinking time to spawn. And that's one of my favorite type of oysters is right before they spawn is what Dan was saying when they're kind of translucent. They built up all this energy and then they spawn and they kind of lose a lot of their uh, flavor. But before they spawn, when you shuck them, you can see uh, like the sperm inside of the oyster. What? Yeah. And uh, oysters are protandric hermaphrodites. So meaning they're all males when born and will switch you know, around two to three years or so of age, they'll switch to a female. So I know when farming oysters and you're doing your brood stock for spawning, when you get that female, you're really pumped because most of those are going to be males. So you get most oysters are going to have that sperm in them. So you have these really like sweet punches of flavor and it's like, it's delicious. If learning about the spawning of oysters is more than you ever wanted to know, how about some practical advice now? what to drink with said oysters. No, you drink whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we encourage that. I mean, traditionally, there's, there's, there's beautiful oyster wines out there. You can never go, ro- go wrong with a glass of bubbles, whether it's champagne or a cava or something like that. To be honest, there's a lot of Russians out there that had it right. You know, chilled vodka and oysters is definitely a thing. Uh, stout, and oysters is definitely a thing. Pilsners yeah. and oysters, that's what yeah. I do. <laughs> I'm, yeah, you know, they're, they're even uh, oyster stout uh, is a style of stouts yeah. that, that are still brewed to this day. Brassworks Brewing in Waterbury, Connecticut. There you they go. took uh, a bunch of our oyster shells, and it gives this cool calcium flavor to the stout, and it's a, that's what oyster stouts are. They just use the shell yeah. and some of the meats to, in their brewing process. You know, when you eat the oyster, that's such a critical moment. And so many people, when they get in front of a dozen oysters or whatever, they just start throwing them back. You, you really want to take your time. You want to get that liquor in your mouth. You want to make sure you chew the oyster because that experience in itself is magical. And if you happen to be drinking, you know, in a nice glass of Sancerre or a, a Spanish, you know, chocolate or, you know, a nice stout, that certainly complements it. But at the end of the day, a good oyster, and in particular, the liquor that's in that shell, you don't want to muddy that up. That was Dan Miser, owner of Oyster Club and Mystic. Great news for all the regulars who have missed the restaurant since March. Oyster Club's renovation is complete, and those gorgeous orange doors are open to the guests once again. We also heard from oyster farmer and co-owner of Sixpenny Oyster Farm, Will Cedia. He gave Plum so many ideas for new band names. Will you be playing drums for them? I'll play all the instruments, all of them. (laughs) Coming up, my conversation with the coolest kelp farmer in Stonington, or maybe even anywhere, Susie Flores. Slimy might not be the right word. I would say... uh, Appetizingly slimy. You can tell that it's something that is supposed to be in water. (laughs) You're listening to Seasoned. I'm Chef Plum. And I'm Marisol Castro. We'll be right back. I'm Marisol Castro. This is Seasoned. 
If shellfish isn't your thing, but you're interested in exploring the ocean for delicious things to eat aside from fish, farmer Susie Flores just might be able to turn you on to her crop, seaweed. Susie and her husband own Stonington Kelp Company, one of the largest commercial seaweed farms in Connecticut, growing and selling food-grade sugar kelp to local restaurants and shops. She and her family eat quite a bit of it themselves. I asked her how she got into ocean farming. It was a perfect storm. My husband and I moved out of uh, the New Jersey area and we knew we were gonna be living near water. We were, he manages marinas. And so I said, well, why not try to grow a garden in the ocean for us to eat sea vegetables? I had learned about how great it was for the environment and how healthy they can be. And as a, I don't you know, really eat a lot of meat, uh, I thought that this would be a great way to kind of supplement for our family. And that started me on a very slippery slope that landed me where I am today. <laughs> What had been your working knowledge of seaweed farms or ocean farming before that moment? I had, uh, I think it's fair to say, absolutely no knowledge of seaweed farms. Um, I had no understanding of a market for seaweed, if one had even existed. I knew of seaweed because I have been to the beach before. I knew, I had read a little bit about the environmental impacts of seaweed, but to me it always felt like something that was outside of just kind of being in the way when I'm trying to lay my beach blanket, something that was from a far, far away place. I didn't think of food grade seaweed being cultivated uh, domestically. To me, it was always, you know, something that happened in uh, Asia. Yeah. Or something, I I have memories of me being a child in Orchard Beach, which is part of the Long Island Sound in the Bronx. And my sister and I would play with seaweed in our hair and pretend like, oh, we were mermaids and we just emerged and here was a sea monster on our head. And you have now dedicated your entire life to this, which is pretty cool, I have to say. Farming to begin with is so elusive. There are so many things that can go wrong. You know, you're battling the elements. And that is with soil that you can just walk over to. How does it work in the sea because you can't I mean no one can control the sun but especially if what you're growing is underwater how does this all work I think the trickiest part for our ocean farm is making sure that wind conditions are right making sure that the waves aren't too choppy for us to access the farm you're going out into um, we're in the Fisher's Island Sound and we're hooking on to lines that are anchored to stay in place so if the the seaweed line is on the side of one of the cleats of my boat and waves are coming from the wrong direction. Like it's very easy to find yourself swamped. It's very easy to find yourself in a sticky situation. So I am a, uh, I mean, we all are, but I am especially a slave to the weather when it comes to us harvesting, um, out planting, doing any sort of gear checks. Soil is locked in place. You kind of have the field that you're um, working and that's it. With the ocean, it's constantly moving. So I'm getting fresh nutrition yeah. spread across my farm, completely you know, free. I don't have to do anything to it. It's no energy. It's the energy of the ocean. So in a weird way, I'm, I think I'm a lot luckier than terrestrial farmers. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. You have a constant ebb and flow. And I guess as someone who's not a farmer, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what? how am I contributing to the utter destruction of the ocean? But you're looking at it completely differently. What nutrients are my crops. Can I call them crops? Are they crops? Yeah. yeah, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So how does that work? Tell me what a typical day looks like in the life of an ocean farmer. And your crop is sugar kelp, yes? Yes. We grow sugar kelp exclusively, which is the only seaweed um, you can legally grow for human consumption in the state of Connecticut. Like I said, it's still pretty new industry. So there's, there's a lot of careful thought that goes into the regulation process. So they're not rushing anything out to market. Uh, the, the Department of Environmental Protection is, I think, doing a great job being cautious but forward thinking. So I, I enjoy more than anything the opportunities to get out onto the water. I try to get out onto the water, visit the farm maybe once a week. It's not something that requires multiple visits unless I'm in the harvest season. During the harvest season, I'm going out as soon as somebody needs 500 pounds, 300 pounds, 200 pounds, we'll go out and we harvest to order. It's a lot of checking to make sure everything's still in place. We do a lot of research on our farm. We partner with different biologists, different environmental researchers who are trying to measure the carbon load that the seaweed farm is absorbing out of the ocean. So oftentimes we're going out and we're taking measurements, we're taking water samples, we're taking tissue samples from the seaweed blades 
decades as they grow. You know, I'll send it back to a lab and very smart people do their thing. It's trips out to the farm like that. It's usually just a couple hours. A lot of my time though is spent on back end stuff, the non-boat related activities, <laughs> such as trying to find restaurants, trying to do education with different schools, trying to create new channels for me to find homes for my seaweed. In addition to being an ocean farmer, you're also on an expedition if you're looking at samples and working closely with some government agencies. Was that a byproduct of deciding one day, we're going to go from New Jersey to Connecticut and start an ocean farm? Or was that (laughs) top of mind? You wind up having a partnership with all of the state regulators and the government agencies just because of the way that the licensing is set up. It's very similar to the way oyster farmers are regulated in our state. The universities oftentimes will reach out to us. They have a grant, for instance, that maybe they're working on and they want to learn more about the way like seaweed could have an impact on certain nutrient levels in the water. So they need a farmer. You know, here I am with my hand raised saying like, I'm happy to take you out. Any excuse to get on the boat. So that's usually where those partnerships happen. They're, they're fairly organic. I haven't found myself having to actively try to seek them out. People tend to find us probably because there's not that many seaweed farmers in our state. Remind me again, how many years you've been doing this? This is our fourth year. So we're going to go into our fourth harvest in 2021. Holy smokes. They're babies. They're absolute babies. They're absolute babies. The farm, it's it's essentially replaced every year. We have a 10 acre site in the Fishers Island Sound and it's leased. So that's not our 10 acre plot of ocean. And what we lease is the right to cultivate seaweed there in a, a specified period of time. So our lease runs basically from Halloween to um, the end of spring. So we only have gear in the water at that time. So the seaweed that we outplant in, uh, you know, Thanksgiving of 2020 this year will be harvested in 2021, and then it'll be fully removed from the ocean. Wow. Is that time frame because that's when you're harvesting, that's when you start to finish? The seaweed that we grow is a winter crop, so it thrives during the winter months And as the waters start to warm, the quality of the seaweed will degrade. Additionally, uh, we're in Stonington, Connecticut. It's a big recreational ocean area. So there's also recreational use for the water. Tons of fishing happens. Actually, we're one of the last commercial fishing fleets in the state of Connecticut. So there's a lot of boats coming and going. And so that's another thing that they consider. Um, And then there's just, you know, between Fisher's Island and Watch Hill and uh, Stonington are all kind of destinations for folks. So there's a lot of just boat traffic. Boat traffic. That's something that terrestrial farmers, I reckon, do not. That's something that they're thinking about. (laughs) No, not that they're thinking about. Talk to me about your crop, sugar kelp. What is it? What can I use it in or for? I grow food grade sugar kelp. And that's because in the state of Connecticut, there's only one way that they know how to regulate us. So it's the best, highest quality, heavily tested, monitored kelp that we know won't harm humans when it's you know handled properly. Food grade sugar kelp can be used, you can eat it raw right out of the ocean. It's very salty. What does it taste like? I, I like it. I'm around it a lot. So me, I might just also be using it. <laughs> you did not sound so convincing, Susie. I <laughs> like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it can be very bitter. It's kelp is, our sugar kelp, it's very high in iodine and that iodine carries a very bitter flavor. But for me, I prefer that. So when you eat it raw, it's exactly, the texture is going to be exactly what you imagine the seaweed that you see in the ocean. So slimy? Slimy might not be the right word. I would say- uh, Appetizingly slimy. You can tell that it's something that is supposed to be in water. <laughs> so equal parts briny and appropriately ocean smooth. Yes, ocean smooth. I like that. (laughs) Um, It is the same seaweed. If you ever go to a restaurant and order a seaweed salad. I just had a seaweed salad a couple of nights ago. Yeah. And so if if you take a a blade of fresh sugar kelp and you dip it in water that's not quite boiling, but pretty hot, it's going to change color from this very beautiful olive brown to electric bright green. It's a color that you don't think should exist in nature. It's so bright green. And then you can chop that up. Uh, You can, sometimes I get like a pizza cutter and I roll it into whatever shape noodle I would want it to be. And I use it in all different types of salads. I'll use it in pasta. So I'll mix it in with um, like fettuccine that I'm making for my family because it's incredibly high in uh, vitamins and minerals. And it also kind of adapts to whatever flavor you are putting it in. So like seaweed, 
egg salad, I'm sure what, for the most part, people know what the dressing tastes like, yeah. but they don't really know, they couldn't identify the flavor of the actual seaweed. Right. It sauces very well. Interesting. It, it kind of, it's crazy. So it loses when you dip it in that boiling water and it turns that bright green, it's losing the iodine. It's, it's you know, dropping a lot of that off. It's having a chemical reaction that winds up changing the flavor of it pretty dramatically. Susie, do you moonlight as a scientist as well? <laughs> I know I would so. <laughs> but I um, have been homeschooling third grade science, so maybe that's why I feel well, so. Well, <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, if you if you need a break from third grade science and want to switch over to sixth grade science, I will gladly barter with you. I don't know what I'll barter, <laughs> but let's 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 figure something. I'll teach them Spanish if you teach mine some science. Perfect. Okay. Done. You also sell sea salt. Is that a direct byproduct of the sugar kelp? Yeah. So the seaweed, in addition to eating it fresh, you can dry it and use it as a spice. And because it comes from the ocean, it's naturally carrying a lot of salts in it. I mean, that's what it, it's basically like a pickle sitting in brine all day long, but it's ocean water. So it's very, very salty. So when we dry it, it has a strong umami flavor. Mm. So you can use it in any dish where you would want to incorporate that. And so we'll grind it up into flakes. And I figured... You know, we're on this like very clean, gorgeous ocean, you know, farm. Why not start harvesting the seawater as well and turning that into salt? So we've been doing kind of different salt combinations that some of it is seaweed steeps in the water while it's starting to evaporate. Sometimes we just add flakes directly into the salt. So you're getting salt, but also that kind of umami punch with the uh, kelp flakes. And sometimes it's just plain salt because salt is fabulous. As you were talking, I was thinking about, I'm not sure if you watched, salt, acid, heat. <sighs> Samin Nostrat, I'm screwing up the thing, but yeah. she does this whole trip to Asia and seeing all those farmers take all the, the salt out. Is that is that similar to what you do? It's the exact same thing, but on a much, a much less refined, <laughs> less classy scale. <laughs> I don't believe but you. Yeah, that was actually, that was one of the um, kind of inspirations for some of the salts that we were trying to make. And they use a different species of seaweed, uh, which all of them, you know, they have a meroir, if you will. And so there's, you know, different seaweeds can lend themselves to different flavors, different dishes. Since I'm kind of stuck with just one, we played around a little bit. Sugar kelp is nice because it is not as, it has a sweetness to it. Mm. I was going to ask, the moniker sugar, I would think it's got a little bit of a sweetness to it. Yeah, especially when it's young, like so younger in the season, when we, like in April, you're going to, it's much more tender, kind of like baby kale and, and baby spinach. It's much more tender and it doesn't carry as much of the bitterness as the fully mature flakes. So Susie, when you decide you and your family are going to come up here, you, you land on, on Stonington and you decide to become an ocean farmer, was the crop already there or did you have to bring it? Every year we get seed string from an approved seed string purveyor. What is seed string? It's kind of misleading. I don't, I don't plant kelp in the ocean. I take existing kelp and I move it to my ocean farm. So I'm taking little one millimeter long seaweed blades and I'm putting them out into the ocean for them to grow. Wow. All we really had to do was find a site that worked with all of the state's regulations in terms of safety and, and that worked um, with the local community so that, you know, they wouldn't we, we weren't, you know, impeding anybody's view, sure. or, you know, anything like that. Not that the seaweed farm, you can really even see it. Um, right. And then we had to think about whether or not it's a place where seaweed actually would want to grow, you know, that there's enough nutrient load and, and the current is right and the sun hits it. And, and then also environmental considerations about whether or not we are, by putting anchors and structures into the ocean, are we destroying some sort of um, eelgrass habitat or, you know, is there something that we need to be concerned about? So that was a really big job and thank god i didn't have to also grow the seaweed from <laughs> scratch right right um, but what connecticut does is they have a couple there's not not very many of them but they have a couple operations that are licensed to sell the string and so that process uh looks like it'll be uh scuba divers going out they often they go out in our area kind of near where our farm is we've actually taken them out on our boat sometimes you know and for the kind of vessel that they're jumping on and off and they just go hunting for wild, wild kelp they have some parameters for things that they're looking for, but essentially they'll take those samples back to a nursery and they put the reproductive tissue, the sorus tissue from the seaweed 
and this is like a really dumbed down version because that's the only version I understand. It's but the only version that... I understand also, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so they take the reproductive tissue and they put them in a tank, like a fish tank. And inside that fish tank is ocean water that they've, you know, kind of cleaned, but it's ocean water uh, that's kept at the right temperature. It has the right lighting. Um, it has the right airflow. And then inside of it is a PVC pipe that's about maybe a foot and a half long. And around the PVC pipe is tightly wrapped kite string, like regular old white kite string that you would use if you were flying a kite, tightly wrapped around the PVC pipe. When the seaweed starts to reproduce, it wants to attach to a substrate. And that's what happens in, in nature, right? Like, so they, they find rocks, something hard that they can attach to, and then they develop. So the only substrate it can attach to is the string. That's around the PVC pipe. It's like the simplest, most brilliant thing when it's time to go and the water temperatures in Stonington are low enough and the ambient temperatures are, you know, not too, too cold. We bring those PVC pipes out on our boat and then we unfurl that kite string around long lines that are suspended in the ocean. And then we just kind of hope nothing happens. <laughs> so that's why we're checking on it all the time. Is there anything devastating that you've seen? You know, you've gone out and you're like, oh, wow. Didn't yeah. Work there's a lot of risks that you run. Like if, if a boat were to run over the farm, I mean, the, for me, the bigger devastation would be somebody getting hurt, but right. um, yeah, you could easily lose your, your farm that way. Um, hurricanes can knock the seaweed if it's not strong enough and hasn't attached to the line up, it can knock it clear off. If, if even just, you know, high winds or high currents, but it is a pretty hardy and tenacious algae. It hangs on in all sorts of conditions. Mm -hmm. This year, you know, the seaweed was unaffected by the coronavirus. Why grow kelp? I know initially you were saying that you were looking at sea vegetables as a mom. I can't say that I blame you. But to me, I feel like as I look at the ecosystem, pun intended, of ocean farming, there's an environmental side to it. And I suspect an economical side to all of that. So how does that go into your planning and your thinking as a kelp farmer? My husband and I have a marina where we, we live and you know work on a marina and he services moorings in our area and we have a bait and tackle shop. So we have these other businesses, you know, the way we feed our family, it's all it all relies on the water and the water quality being good enough for people to wanna spend their summers here and people wanna put the boats in the water and go fishing in this area. So I see the seaweed farm as a way to contribute to the water quality health of our local area. Seaweed is super, it's very sustainable. It doesn't require any fresh water. It doesn't require any fertilizer. I'm not using any land, which can be both expensive in this area, as you know. And th these resources, they're finite. You know, if water starts to become very scarce and very difficult uh, to come by or just more expensive, it's not something that we have to worry about as an ocean farmer. I can still produce food. And it's one of the foods of the future when, when people talk about a climate change diet. Right. Um, and then also it's extremely fulfilling. Like growing something is, I don't know, it just, it just feels great. You know, I'm out on the water. My, I'm not sitting in traffic trying to get into the Holland Tunnel anymore. <laughs> um, my blood pressure goes down. I see, I've learned all of these new species of birds because we see them out in the ocean. Uh, and we see seals all the time swimming around, fish jumping. It's just it's a good experience for me. It's a, it's a much better way for me to live my life than other things I've tried in the past. So I think that it just kind of checks all these boxes. That was Susie Flores, owner of Stonington Kelp Company. If you want to try cooking with kelp, visit ctpublic.org seasoned to see recipes for seaweed butter, a seaweed omelet, cucumber miso kelp dip, and a ginger kelp smoothie. No comment from you. Plum. I have to say something because it's just so fun to say. Cucumber miso kelp dip. I'm Marisol Castro. <laughs> and I'm Chef Plum, a.k.a. Seaweed Butter. Season is produced by Robin Doyen-Aiken and Katie Tolarski. Thanks for listening.